Hi there. So, how does the brain work? Now, since I'm a neuroscientist, you might have assumed this would be the first video I would record. But the brain itself is only really of interest to us as beings because it relates to issues of our mind, our consciousness. Uh, and it's in that consciousness that all issues of meaning uh, play out. So this is what kind of makes us interested in the brain, uh, by and large. And so I wanted to kind of, you know, touch on those subjects first, um, because thinking about the brain, talking about the brain, uh, is not the be all and end all. It's a piece in the puzzle that tells us about the nature of reality and our place within it. So the answer to the question of how the brain works, obviously isn't going to be just a single simple sentence. Uh, this isn't going to be a, a short little two minute video, so uh, buckle up. Um, but in, in trying to communicate how the brain works, it's good to start with the question of why you have a brain. You know, what function do you think your brain performs? So if I said to you, why do you have a brain? You might say something like, I have a brain in order to think. You know, especially in the modern Western world, this is the capacity that we praise above all else. And we get very obsessed with it. It's useful for, you know, economic productivity. So most of the stuff we do, you know, is, is tied up with thinking. You might think, you know, it's for thoughts in the present moment about what you might want to do in the future or memories of the past, you know, all this that we call cognition in neuroscience, which is just stuff related to thinking. You might think it's to do with, you know, being able to recognize yourself, uh, all these, what we think of as quite high level functions of the brain, because at bottom, this isn't what the brain's about. All that stuff is really the last thing that comes to the show when we're thinking about what the mind is and how it relates to the brain. So if your brain isn't primarily for thinking, what's it for? Well, the confusion that arises when you try to think about what your brain is for, a confusion arises because the concept of you is actually a concept that's being generated by your brain. So, you know, you're seeing the world now using your brain, you're hearing these words using your brain, a brain is communicating this information to you, what we call my brain. And so we're used to this idea of my brain, me, I exist, and I have a brain, I possess it. Now, this doesn't actually make sense. There's no I, there's no soul, there's no James that exists apart from all of this physical stuff and the associated information processing that goes on. So if we try to answer the question of why do I have a brain? we can get very conceptually confused. Now, one of the wonderful things about science is it gives us a way to step outside of those concepts and try to understand the world in a more objective way. So the scientific picture starts with reality, starts with the universe before life. And there's just reality, there's a totality of everything that exists, there's just this one thing. You know, you've got, you think of, a, you know, the singularity, which is the, the kind of where uh, all space and time, you know, is, is in one point before the Big Bang. And that's one thing. And then you have the Big Bang, and you've still just got a single mass of gases. And they start to clump up into planets, and you know, the whole universe evolves. And to our human minds, we start to apply concepts and say, you know, what well, a planet is a different thing to the vacuum uh, that that it's inside, inside of. But it's it's still just this one thing evolving over time, this one reality, this one universe. So you've got this one physical system evolving and differentiating and becoming planets, and then you get life. You get simple life to begin with, single cells, 
that evolve into complex life like us. So not coming at this from thinking about James and James's brain or you and your brain, but instead physical reality that becomes life. Single physical reality. This one thing that differentiates into these different forms. So a living system like me, we might want to say it has a brain. <laughs> I don't know if you want to say that about me, <laughs> but um, we might make that claim. But even that is a little bit, can be a bit confusing. That's not quite what the question is. Again, because when we say a brain, we're applying a concept to a thing that we've seen pictures of in anatomy textbooks and, you know, TED Talks probably. Um, so that brain, like a brain in a jar, that brain doesn't really exist in the way we think it does. Brains in jars exist, but they're not the brain we're talking about. They're not the functioning brain. A functioning brain never exists alone. It never exists without the body and without all the associated physiology. You know, we as neuroscientists might say things like the brain is made of neurons, which are the brain cells that signal information in the brain. But there's there's blood vessels, there's something called glia, which are these other, other types of, of brain cell. So the brain isn't this, you know, computer that can just be dissociated from the body. What the brain is, is it's one piece of the nervous system. So you might be aware you have the, ner the central nervous system, which is encased in the skull, and that's what we call the brain, and the spinal cord, uh, encased within the spine, and then the peripheral nervous system, uh, nerve cells that stretch out into your skin and your muscles and every single bit of your body. You know, um, at the bottom of your spine, there are nerve cells, individual cells, that are too thin for you to see, but they can be over a meter long because they have to reach all the way down to the soles of your feet. And that will allow you to, you know, feel stuff when you, when you step on something. There's a meter long individual cell there. Well, there's many of them comprising the nerves. So the question really, if you want to understand what the brain is, it's really what is the nervous system? Now, you might be able to see now why I'm saying that brains don't really exist in and of themselves separate from the organism. Because the brain is just one piece of the nervous system and the nervous system is a system. It's something that's distributed through every inch of your body. And even there, you can't separate the nervous system from the other bits of the body. So take something like movement, you know, if I move my arm, there are nerve cells carrying electrical impulses that make muscles contract. But even there, you haven't got a nerve cell and a muscle and there's some kind of barrier between them. If you study this, there's actually a single unit, a neuromuscular unit that does these contractions. So the muscles and the nervous system, there's no clean barrier there. So if you want to understand the brain, you have to appreciate that you're actually trying to understand the functioning of a whole living system, of a whole organism and the role of the nervous system in that whole organism. Now, even there, organisms like ourselves, we have skin, we have this barrier that tries to keep the external world out. But even there, we're not separate fully from our environment. We can never just escape off into some environment where it's just, you know, perfect vacuum and we can just live there. We are symbiotic with our environment. So as a living system, I'm fully embedded in reality. It can't be any other way. So the brain, you can now maybe see, um, when you think about it this way, is not this thing that's separate from reality. It's a piece of reality that's fully embodied, not only in the living system, but in the world, in the environment. Now, what is that nervous system, and perhaps the brain in particular, what is it doing? Why is it there? 
well, so this brings us back to the evolution of life. So before life, you just have blind physics doing its thing. And our reality, one of the most fundamental laws that governs our reality is the second law of thermodynamics. So thermodynamics, thermo is heat, and it is thermodynamics is the field that studies how reality operates basically as a system. Um, so if you think of you pour boiling water into some cold water, the hot water starts in one area and you've got the cold water around it. And gradually we know very quickly, this will all blend together into lukewarm water. And the equations of thermodynamics describe how that happens. And the second law is that in a system like that, it claims that it will move towards increased entropy. Now entropy is a measure of disorder, of homogeneity. So there's high entropy when you've got the lukewarm water at the end. And that's just the way our universe goes. Everything is moving towards decay. Everything is moving towards falling apart. And ultimately, the universe will end up being like that lukewarm water. Some even homogeneous, disordered thing. And at the moment, it's actually, there's order, you know? I'm highly ordered, which is what keeps me alive. My, my, the living process, life process, is one of maintaining order in the face of this disorder, you know, this force of the second law of thermodynamics. So as a living system, I'm a bit of reality that stumbled on a trick where it could try to resist this disorder. So you take a rock in the ocean, that doesn't try to resist this disorder. The rock will just be worn away into sand and it becomes part of the ocean. There's no boundary between the sand on the seafloor, you know, and the water and what we consider to be the entire ocean. So before life, physical systems just blend into each other. And even now, physical systems blend into each other. This is what the second law says. It's why we die. You know, life is an active process of resisting death because death is the default. You know, having everything be formless and just blended into each other, that's where we're going. Um, and in every instant, that's where we're going. Um, incidentally, that's also what gives you time, uh, which is something for another video, maybe. Um, but the the ten, the the um, movement towards increased entropy, you know, when you put milk in coffee and then you have milky coffee, you can do it in that direction, but it, it's much harder to separate it back out. And that's to do with the march towards increased entropy and and the direction of time. But that's for another video. Um, so we have living systems that are keeping themselves together for a period before entropy ultimately wins. Now, how are they doing this? A living system can't just sit there, you know, you could have stuff, you know, as hard as granite, but granite will just wear away as fast as it's going to wear away. It's fully subject to the second law. It's not doing anything to resist it. Even though it appears to us, it happens over such a long time scale that we don't really, you know, it doesn't look like it's just of a piece with the air, but it really is. They're all one system as described by thermodynamics. But with us, we put up a fight. And how do you put up a fight? Well, you have action so you can do things, so you can resist. But that action needs to be guided by sensation. So from single-celled organisms all the way up to us, there's this principle of sensation and action. If you are a single-celled organism, little bacteria, and you're trying to keep your membrane together, you can't just erect a hard granite membrane and then expect to live. To be a living system is to be constantly measuring the destructive forces through sensation and responding. So 
as gravity is pulling down on me now, my muscles have a certain tone that's keeping me pushing back. And this is the fundamental process that keeps us existing. And there's no mystery, really, as to why this should be the case. People still talk as if there's some deep mystery as to why life exists. But there's not really. It's the same logic as with evolution. Things that exist need to be good at existing. Physical systems that stumbled on this trick, they continue to exist because it's a trick for existing. So it's a kind of tautological you know, way of thinking about it, but one that proves a very simple point. That if you're going to be a living creature that exists, you have to have stumbled on this trick. And if you don't, you know, for all the billions of years where this trick wasn't stumbled on, there was no life and there was no one around to care. And then eventually it happens, even if it's incredibly unlikely, it only has to happen the one time and then life proliferates and evolves. So you have life and it's doing this trick. Now, what happens in between the sensation and the action? Well, there, what needs to happen is information processing. Now, what is that? What is information processing? Well, you have the physical world made of physical stuff, but then over and above that, the physical stuff can be moved around in such a way as to convey what we call information. So information exists and it's not just the physical stuff. It's a thing in its own right. It's related to the patterns of physical stuff. But what information is, people can tend to find it's quite hard to, hard concept to grasp, but it's information was initially defined by an engineer called Claude Shannon. And it was initially uh, defined in terms of communication. And that's still what it is mathematically. So an information processing system, whether it's a computer or my brain or anything else, an information processing system processes information, but it does that by having certain assumptions about the way things are and then updating them basically in order to reduce uncertainty. So I'll say this in a few different ways. Um, when you have no information, you're uncertain about a certain situation. So if you come here and you steal my favorite cup and you put it in one of two cupboards, and then you say to me, James, I put it in one of these two cupboards. Um, I'll be completely honest with you when I tell you, but for now I'm not gonna tell you where it is. Well, at that point, I have a 50-50 chance of guessing. I'm very uncertain. I'm actually as uncertain as I could possibly be in that situation. Now, if you honestly tell me it's in the left cupboard, you've reduced my uncertainty completely. It's gone from, I've been gone from being 50%, yeah, 50% chance of being right to 100% chance. You know, this is simplified, assuming you're telling the truth and all that. And actually mathematically, that's one bit one bit of information. Uh, there's a lot of clever maths that figured out, you know, how to quantify this. But your act of communication has signaled something to me. So there's something being communicated or signaled between two systems. You've got the physical reality out there, which I could, I could inspect myself. I could gather the information by looking in the cupboards, or you could signal it through your words because you've already gathered the information by looking in the cupboards and in my brain there's uncertainty which is an informational thing that exists in the way that the physical stuff of my brain is arranged and then either by hearing those sounds that you've said and understanding the words or by looking in the cupboards I've reduced that uncertainty and I've acquired information. So perhaps you can see here that information is fundamentally a quantity 
of uncertainty reduction. So if I'm a single celled organism, or I'm me right now, I have sensation in order to reduce uncertainty as to how the world is. And that's the same as saying I have sensation in order to process information. So without sensation, I have no idea how the world is. I know nothing about it at all. But then if I open my eyes and look around, I can gather information. Photons are reflected off surfaces and then they land on my retina and then electrical signals get sent to my brain. And then it can process the information. It can reduce the uncertainty and say, reality is this particular way rather than all the different ways it possibly could have been, you know, much like the two cupboards. Information is measured against, you know, the full range of uncertainty. So with the two cupboards, there's, you know, two options, but with my eyes closed and if I'm a newborn baby and I've never opened my eyes, the world could be a huge different number of ways. But then when you open your eyes and it's a particular way, that's a lot of information because you've gone from a huge number of different possibilities to one possibility. So now this is what the brain is doing. It's processing information. It's letting us know that reality is one way as opposed to another way. And it obviously can't grasp all of reality in one go. So it actively samples the local reality, the local environment. You know, this is why we move our eyes around. You know, we have these saccades, these quick eye movements to see what's around you. And what you're doing there is you're sampling information to reduce uncertainty. Now, bringing this back to the second law of thermodynamics and entropy, we're doing this in order to survive. We're looking around and we're hearing and we're touching things and we do all this stuff. We really only do it because we're trying to survive. Now, you know, we're very complex creatures and our brains ultimately come up with these high level stories that we tell ourselves about, I'm James and actually I did that because I want this. And you know, those are very narrow, effectively lies that we tell ourselves. What's really happening is there's a single physical reality that started clumping together in a, just a deterministic way, just like clockwork. It just happened, unfolded this way. Eventually it clumped into things that we know as life, little, you know, little physical kind of hurricanes of matter that managed to keep themselves together through sensation and action. And this information processing that happens in between. And then they became more complex into multicellular organisms. And then you've got one of these multicellular organisms sitting here right now talking to you. And there's no there's no James inside that's pulling the levers, some ego with free will. There's just this strange unfolding. You know, I'm fully determined to do what I'm doing right now by not only my personal history, but the history of the entire universe. You know, we know this from physics that everything's going the way it's going to go, basically. <laughs> um, now, this might make you worried about the non-existence of free will and free will doesn't exist. There's no way it could, but I'll do another video on why that's a good thing. You know, um, I don't think any of us would actually want to live in a world where free will exists. So you have living systems and we're sensing and we're acting and we exist and we find ourselves in this strange situation, just being propelled by the forces of nature to just do what we're doing right now. And we can account for certain behaviors like eating food. That's clearly us trying to resist decay and death. And that involves sensing, you know, it involves looking around for food. If you're on the savannah and, you know, you're an early human and you look at, uh, you know, a tree branch and there's a red apple, photons, you know, are falling on your eyes and it's telling you that reality is a certain way and that there's an object there you know, that you've learned is associated with certain wavelengths of light. And so without any free will, without any ego pulling the levers, what happens is that Homo sapien just wanders over to the branch, reaches out its arm, 
plucks the apple and starts eating it. And in other circumstances, it doesn't do that because of other factors. But it's always this. This is always what's happening. It's always this arc of sensation and action in the present moment with information processing in between keeping us going. Just because our ancestors were the ones who were good at keeping going. Yeah, you know, we've just inherited their, their physical structure. Um, just because that's the way it goes. Because it couldn't, we couldn't be here otherwise. You know, all the ones that didn't succeed in walking up to that tree and eating the apple just by chance. Yeah, you know, happened to be how their nervous system was wired. All the ones that had nervous systems wired a different way, they died and they're not around. So you can see where there's these lawful things just, you know, set in motion by the universe. And so this information processing is the role of the brain and the nervous system as a whole. So this is what the brain is for, you know, to answer the, the first question. It's for survival. It's for gathering information. Now, how does it work? Well, I've already alluded to the fact that it works in informational terms. It's a mistake to focus too narrowly on the particular physiology, say, of the human brain. Because, um, you know, if you want to understand what's going on with creatures like ourselves, if you look at an insect, their brain is just kind of a clump on the end of their spinal cord. That you can call it a brain, you might not want to call it a brain, but it's different enough that you could get confused by the differences in physiology. And that's not what's interesting here. What's interesting is the function and what, why it exists, this, this thing that we call a nervous system or a brain. So we want to stick mainly to thinking about the informational content. And how it works, as I've already said, is it produces survival producing behavior, behavior that increases our chance of survival in a blind mechanistic way that's a kind of hangover from evolution this is how it works there's no ego in there pulling the levers it works because the universe has kind of come together at this point in space where you sit as a result of its causal history it's all combined to make this strange very complex thing that you are that your, your brain is. So if you look at a mountain and you think about how tectonic plates had to move to, to rise into the air and then glaciers had to like cut it down to give it a certain shape and rain had to fall and make it erode, you know, there's a huge number of different factors and it gives you perhaps a very beautiful, astoundingly complex structure. You are exactly the same kind of thing. Your brain is exactly the same kind of thing, but just raise you know the number of variables to just an unimaginable amount everything that's ever happened to you everything that's ever happened to the species everything that's ever happened in the universe that can you know can produce causal ripples that that reach the earth all of this stuff is why you have a brain you know you wouldn't exist here without the sun right being in our solar system for example so the brain and the nervous system are bits of reality that are in the job of funneling other bits of reality you know you're like a some point at which reality folds back on itself and it starts to see itself through sensation and respond to itself through action and you're like this little whirlpool and we can just it so happens that this process the information the information processing gives us consciousness and we can witness it and we can just, you know, we suddenly find ourselves here and we can just look around and be like, wow, <laughs> look at what's happening. <laughs> what a strange situation to find ourselves in, you know? Um, so in a more precise way, if you want to talk about how the human brain works or the mammalian brain, the sensation that happens through us being we find ourselves in a in a, a bath of energy you know we've got 
sound waves coming at us, we've got photons streaming at us, it's all these energy patterns. And we're in the middle of it all. And there's just energy everywhere. And we want to gather information about the nature of reality. Well, we don't want to. Our brains have you know, been set in motion to do this by evolution. And so creatures that stumbled on useful tricks for doing this survived. And so we find ourselves with things like retinas and eardrums and skin that's sensitive to me mechanical pressure. So if you take the eye, you have cells that became sensitive to light. So if you think about the evolution of the eye, you know, Darwin was, was really unsettled by the eye. Uh, it's like uh, the peacock's tail as well. He was, there were a few things that he thought didn't make sense in terms of evolution. But you know, we actually now know it's, they're very simple in terms of evolution. You know, you don't need a fully functioning complex eye like mine to, you know, for it to be useful to see. And so we now know there are creatures that have just little clumps of cells that are sensitive to light, and that's it. And they can give it a basic gradient of, you know, the sun's over here, so maybe there's plankton over there, you know, in these like sea creatures, and it's dark over here. You've just got a gradient, and that's useful. Now, if you create an eye socket, you know, you pull that little clump of light sensitive cells inside, you can actually get a bit more information about the angle of the light. And then if you grow a bit of translucent um, lens over it, you can start to focus it more. And, you know, in this way, you build up something as complex as a human eye. But in terms of understanding how the brain works, the important thing is that first step is the clump of light sensitive cells. And all that happened there is cells like skin cells, like any other type of cell, they just stumbled on a chemical reaction that changed light energy into a, so it changed light energy into electricity, basically. And it does that by absorbing the energy and causing a cascade of salt, basically across in and out of the cell. Now this happens because we evolved, you know, our ancestors evolved in water, salt water in the sea. And much like how everything we are is just fully contingent on the nature of the universe around us. Our brains, exactly the same way, you know, the salt water, so our spinal fluid, the fluid inside our skull that, that kind of cushions your brain, that's salt water, basically. It's very similar to saline, to the water you find in the ocean. And that's because we evolved in the ocean and we evolved this trick of opening up little pores in cells to allow sodium ions, the, the salt in the water, to flow in and out. And ions contain, they carry electrical charge. And you do that, you've suddenly got electricity in the cell. You've got an electrical difference between the inside and the outside. And you've converted light into electricity. And so it's also just interesting to note that this is, you know, we're carrying around this bowl of salt water basically in our heads because our brains evolved in the ocean. Um, it's just quite a funny thing. So this trick is done where it can be mechanical pressure, can produce this change in salt levels that produces electricity. It can be the eardrum moving, which moves, actually moves liquid in something called the cochlea and that flow of water moves other cells. But basically you've got energy, whether it's mechanical or light or whatever, you know, chemicals in the, in the, uh, in the case of smell and it's converted into electri electricity by specialized cells. That's the, and that's the gateway to the nervous system. Now, what happens there is energy becomes information. It becomes encoded. It becomes represented. So in the same way that the word glass isn't a glass or the word water isn't water, you can't drink the word water, right? You can only drink water itself. And water itself isn't the word water, isn't the sound water. Well, in the same way, you get series a series of electrical pulses or gradients of electricity moving up and down in these cells 
and that signals corresponds to the energy that's come into the system. So now you have informational representations of the outside world. The brain now has its own language in electricity for talking to itself about the outside world. And I'm using talking here to talk to me and like, you know, sending and receiving information, communicating, you know, information processing, like we spoke about. So now the information is in the system and the opposite happens, you know, where the output of the brain sends electrical pulses to the muscles, makes them contract. And then that's how you get action. And then in between, you've got really what we think of as the brain. When we, when we say the brain, there's all the stuff in between. And the brain is a networked system, much like the internet, you know, or you know, social networks. It comprises of cells that are connected together with different strengths. Now, this is where the answer that you were probably looking for as to how the brain works lies. So we've, we've outlined what it does. It does this information processing that maps sensation onto action. And it's worth saying that is even what's happening in the case of memory. You know, you, you store memories in order to help you behave better in the present in order to survive. You know, you eat food in order to survive. Even if you have a fantasy about buying a big house in the future, those thoughts are arising out of a brain that has evolved to survive. And so you're projecting, you're making plans because that's useful for survival. You're thinking about a large house, you know, which, you're th which is another way of saying you're thinking about um, acquiring enough resources, acquiring lots of resources, which is another good thing for survival. A uh, house, shelter, you know, from temperature changes and other things that are destructive to us. Um, rain and, you know, weather conditions. Um, as well as, you know, like social status. That's another thing in, in social primates like us that's good for survival. So even something that seems, you know, you might say my brain is for things like that. Fantasizing about buying a big house in the future. But you can see if you break it down, that's just like eating an apple. It's just, you know, a behavior that's arising out of this system that's been set in motion to survive. So, sorry, a little tangent. Um, so you have the brain doing this, and how is it doing it? So it's a networked system, and it's a dynamical system, which means it's not just this like rigid and uh, network that just sits there. It's constantly changing, constantly updating, and fundamentally, it's mapping, mapping between sensation and action. Now, this is extremely active area of neuroscience research. The kind of you know things that I spend my day job doing is thinking about how this happens. But conceptually, this is the answer. This is the answer as to how the brain works. It does informational mapping between sensation and action because it was propelled to do so as a physical system by evolutionary dynamics of survival. Now, it's hard to go into a lot more detail about how it does that. And that's in part because the brain's a very rich system. There are different pathways you could talk about. You could talk about precisely how vision works. You could talk about the circuit, you know, that allows you to withdraw your hand from a fire, uh, you know, with this like unconscious reflex. There are lots of different individual pathways, but they all abide by the same scheme that I've outlined here. But the if you want to talk about the kind of abstract generalizable rule of how the brain works in all these cases, it works by building up models of, of the world. And this is another way of saying, you know, when you're uncertain, your model is everything's equally likely. Everything, it, the reality could be, who knows how reality could be. It could be any one of a number of different ways. And then as you gather information and reduce that range of uncertainty, you're effectively building up a model, a guess, a belief about the way the world is. And this is the core of how the brain works. It builds up these beliefs in informational terms by gathering information and not just passively, not just like hearing, you, you know, we move our eyes around to actively gather information 
that will update our models most effectively. So this process is set in motion by something, the same dynamics that allow you a system like ourselves to survive over time, just through this bottom up evolutionary dynamics. Those dynamics, it turns out, account for all these behaviors of, of belief forming and the behavior we then perform afterwards. So if I don't know what's behind me, I'll look, right? That what's going on there is I'm a system that wants to survive and I have a brain that has a model of the world and there's a blank space in it. So without having to think about it, the brain pulls the right levers to turn me around, to make me look what's behind me. You know, I'm scanning the environment to update my model. Now I'm doing that to make sure I survive, but fundamentally there's a, a process where if you don't do that, you're going to be surprised a lot and being surprised as a living system in this world that's falling apart as you know, thanks to the second law of thermodynamics, being surprised a lot is synonymous with dying. It's synonymous with decay. If you're constantly being hit around by stuff and being surprised, your models aren't working and you're going to fall apart and systems that were surprised a lot aren't around anymore. So this idea of surprise is really crucial to how the brain works. And the, so the brain minimizes surprise. And it's doing this by, through these evolutionary dynamics. This is largely the work of a colleague of mine at University College London, where I work called Carl Friston. He's probably gonna end up winning the Nobel Prize for this stuff eventually. Um, he deserves it. Um, so this idea is you have this behavior of, you know, scanning the environment in order to minimize surprise. You have ideas about the way the world is and you don't want to be surprised. So you're going to scan the environment and the brain takes on the form that needs to be taken on in order for this to happen because we're the beings that survived. So we have to have that. And so in neuroscience, there's a lot of work in trying to understand what that looks like computationally. You know, we're lagging behind mathematically, really. Um, the kinds of information processing the brain is doing is very alien, you know, to what our computers are currently doing. Computers work by certain, you know, binary computational logic uh, that's linked with the idea of information I was talking about earlier. But living systems have effectively been designed by evolution, by this incredibly, well, this process that's had all of the history of life to hone this, to hone this, hone this stuff, you know, it's done, it's prototyped to every generation, countless numbers of times. So it really is like our brains have been designed by some alien intelligence. So in terms of being able to describe, say, to a, an engineer, how the brain works so that they could implement it in a machine, we're making good progress there. Uh, but that would be probably more detail than most people would be interested in. But so the answer fundamentally is that the brain is the, the organ, the bit of physical reality, the bit of physical stuff inside us that carries the information that maps sensation onto action in order to keep us alive. And it does that by building up models, testing those models through behavior in order to minimize how surprised it is and thereby minimize it's falling apart. And this just gets perpetuated because the systems that do that, they survive. So that's basically how the brain works. <laughs>